Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to BFC Live. It is so great to see all of you bright and early for church this morning today. My name is Camden, and if we haven't already met, I serve as an on-staff pastor here at BFC, and I am so glad to be watching live with you right now for church here at Bethany First Church of the Nazarene. Today is an awesome Sunday morning, and it's not just because we are here in person uh, celebrating and praising our, our God, but because you are joining us here online as well. We have a special day today because we also have baby dedications in our services later. I am so excited to see some babies get baptized and see their families declare that they are going to raise those childs up in the ways that God has laid out for us. It's gonna be so awesome and so powerful as a church congregation to also come alongside those families and say, we are affirming that call on your life and we also take that upon ourselves and a burden of ourselves to help you in that endeavor. It is such a powerful movement and I cannot wait to celebrate those with you later on in service today. I think that as the summer uh, kind of goes further on, today we are almost near the end of July, we're almost to August, it's a really important time for us to think about what's coming up in the fall. If you are new with us today, at BFC. Maybe you just moved to the OKC Bethany area and you're looking for a church home. I would love to extend to you a welcome and just say, we are so glad you're here and thanks for considering BFC as your home church. If you have any kids in your family, we would love to get them connected and you connected further at BFC as we enter into the fall um, season. We're coming up on that. It's a big season for the church as we get back into a rhythm from the summer. And if you have a family here, or if you would like to get more connected going into the fall, please scan the QR code that's gonna come across the screen right now. Or if you'd like, just let me know down in the comments. Let me, let me know that you want to get connected further this fall. Just type, I would love to get connected. And I will reach out to you uh, to sometime in the next week. And love to connect with you further then and get you connected with the ministry areas that apply for you this fall. It's going to be awesome. We have BFC youth that's going to get ramped back up. BFC college, if you're a college student coming to the area. We have Pastor Brixton that would love to connect with you. We have BFC group life. There are so many ways to get connected here and I want to help you find the best one for you. As we get started with service today, I want to say that we have a guest speaker today is Dr. Keith Newman. He's the president of Southern Nazarene University right across the street from BFC. We are so excited to hear what Dr. Newman has to say for us today and what he has to reveal in God's word with us today as well. We've had Dr. Newman speak before and I know that he has a powerful message prepared for us that's gonna be so impactful for us and we are looking forward to it. So as we get started today, just a reminder, I want to connect with you, and we would love to see you next week here for BFC Live. Well, let's go ahead and get started with worship today. Christ 
pastors here on staff, and it is the joy and honor and privilege of my life to be one of your pastors, especially this group right over here, all these students. I love, love these guys. Hey, we are so, so glad that you are here, whether you are a first-time attender or a regular attender. Our desire and our hope is to connect with each and every one of you. We want to walk through this life and this faith and all that it has to offer together. We want to get you plugged into this community because we want to do life together. So the best way you can help us to do that, to get you plugged in, is by filling out a connect card or scanning the QR code on your screen for our online watchers. The connect cards are underneath the armrests of your seat. You can fill that out and drop it in the give and connect boxes as you exit the sanctuary. And a pastor from this church, maybe myself, maybe my man Brent Hardesty right over here, will get back to you this week about that card. 
Maybe you're not just a first time attender at BFC. Maybe it's you're new to this whole faith thing in general. You're new to what this Jesus life is. Or maybe you know somebody that's new to the faith. Then I believe our Alpha course can help you. I believe our Alpha course can help you. It was made for people who are not just encouraging and growing believers, but it was made for skeptics. It was made for people who are curious about faith and life and its biggest questions. It is a place of open and honest conversation to dive into those questions and what they mean and what Jesus has to say about them in a community of people who are like you, who are different than you, and all of the above. We would love to see you there. In our first class back is going to be August 20th. It is at Serve Coffee Shop, which is just across the street, and you can get here. You can get there. August 20th at 6.30 p.m. If you are interested in volunteering in this ministry, or if you or someone you know is interested in attending you can also mark that on that connect card or on the QR code that is popping up on your screen and you can drop that off again in the give and connect boxes as you exit the sanctuary. We believe that ministries like Alpha are making a difference for the kingdom of God. We believe that it's making a difference in people's lives and helping spread the good news that Jesus was born, died, and rose again and is living with us currently as a savior of all of our sins. We believe that that is true. And ministries like Alpha are helping to get that good news out into the world. But we could not do it if it weren't for you and your help and your faithfulness in giving. I speak for all of us here on staff and our church as a whole that we are grateful, grateful for you and your help in this way. If you're interested in continuing to give, you can do so online or by dropping off your physical giving outside once again in those give and connect boxes as you exit the sanctuary. Thank you so much. Let's continue in worship together.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking.
and take a seat. Told you it was a, a see you later, not a goodbye. I'm back, better than ever. And I'm here with my family. I get the honor and privilege today uh, to dedicate uh, three of my uh, nieces and nephews. We got my niece here. This is Ryan Oakley McGinnis. Ryan, can you wave? I didn't think you would. That's all right. And this right here is Breck and Zane. Okay, I'll hand them off to you, Mom, or someone. And then this right here is Barrett Asher. And it's uh, an honor today uh, to get to dedicate uh, these kiddos. Um, so Mitchell and Brittany, all right, we got Brittany. This is my older sister right here. She's incredible. And my brother-in-law, Mitchell. And so Mitch and Brittany, by bringing your children here today, you are signifying that you have a faith in Jesus yourself and that you desire for them, these kids, to have a faith in Jesus that they would know and follow him, right? That's why you're here this morning. Hey, our Uncle Bricks right here, he's going to read uh, their family verse. This is a passage for all three of these kiddos. Total honor and privilege to be able to read this verse for these three kiddos, this family verse. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes, through, comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message of Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God our Father. Amen. Amen. I love it. One body ruled with peace. That's right. That's good. Good stuff. Hey, we know that, uh, you know, raising kids, uh, it is the parents' duty, but not uh, just the parents. It falls on the family uh, as well. And I'm reminded of my sister and me and my brother and Mitch and his brother, and it didn't take just the parents. It took the entire family. So family, parents and family together, uh, do you commit today to uh, teach Ryan, Brecken, and Barrett to fear the Lord, watch over their education, direct their minds to the scriptures, their feet to the sanctuary, and keep them from the evil that is in the world. If so, say we will. Awesome. Hey, and I said it too when I was leaving, but uh, it's also the church body, right? Y'all are going to be investing in these kiddos, uh, going to camp with them, maybe changing their diapers or teaching them about Jesus, all sorts of things, okay? So church as well, do y'all commit to teaching Ryan Brecken and Barrett to fear the Lord, watch over their education, direct their minds to the scriptures, their feet to the sanctuary, and keep them from the evil that is in the world. If so, you can say, we will. We will. Amazing, amazing. Well, hey, it is uh, my uh, honor and uh, my humble honor to dedicate Ryan Oakley and Brecken Zane and Barrett Asher in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for the gift of kids and the gift of family. Um, God, you are all about love. It's who you are and it's what you do. And uh, I don't know if there's a better representation of your love than the gifts of family. And so God, thank you so much for these three incredible kids. And God, I pray that you would please watch over them, bless them, keep them safe, give them hopes and dreams and aspirations in this life. But God, more than anything, would they fall more in love with you each and every day? God, would they come to know you um, as their savior and as someone who loves them and cares for them and has a plan for them? And God, would they live their lives in relationship with you, knowing and believing that it is the best way to live life? And God, I pray over our family, God, that you would help uh, this family raise these kids and that you would be with them and continue to bless us like you have. God, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all, uh, give them a hand. Misty right here, she's got some gifts. Uh, these are some Bibles and uh, certificates. We don't forget this. Give them a hand as we uh, walk, off, walk off stage here. Well, it's always amazing to see 
God at work in the lives of families. And at BFC, we get that blessing uh, a lot, and we don't want to take that lightly. And so the charge that, that you just heard mentioned to the congregation, I ask each and every one of you, be involved in the lives of the kids here at BFC. Uh, you, will never, you will never regret time spent with prayer, high-fiving kids in the hallway, getting to know them. And we are just so appreciative of all the people that do give their time and their service uh, to teaching and educating our children here and loving on them the way that you do. Thank you for that. This morning, uh, Pastor Rick is still with the team in Eswatini, and we are privileged with another speaker that comes from within our own congregation. Like Pastor Larry last week, uh, this week we get to hear from Dr. Keith Newman. Dr. Keith Newman and his wife Carolyn are a part of our church, uh, but they are also involved with leading Southern Nazarene University. Uh, Keith has been the president there uh, now for a number of years, but he's also spent 17 years being a pastor, as well as the 15 years that he's spent in higher education. And we are just blessed as a church. Normally when pastors take vacation or they go on trips and they leave and they're away, um, they, uh, they sometimes even struggle to find someone to come and, and preach in their place. And we've been so blessed to have Pastor Larry last week and then now Dr. Keith Newman with us this week. Will you guys welcome Dr. Keith Newman as he comes and opens the word for us? Hey, good morning, good morning. It is great to be here with you this morning. I was telling Pastor Ken earlier that uh, this is always a scary privilege. So uh, I do count it a privilege, and I'm thankful to Pastor Rick for, for the privilege of being able to share the word with you this morning. Well, SNU students know that I love stories, so why not start with a story, right? Bricks? Yeah. What would it be without a story? Here's the story. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is uh, Dr. Vic Pence. Uh, Dr. Pence became the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. Really large mega church, a, a church where there's lots of famous people that are actually a part of the church. And, and he and his family moved a number of years ago from the great Northwest, Washington State, I believe, to, to the fourth largest city in the United States. And when they got there, they started planning almost immediately for a cousin camp. Uh, some cousins of the, the two daughters that he had that were in middle school would come. They would kind of take turns visiting each other's homes. And they had never been to Houston. They had never been to their home. And so plans were underway for the cousin camp that, that summer. Well, Vic is a fun guy, and so he came up with a, an idea. He went to his middle school daughters, and he said, how about this? How about instead of us picking them up at the airport and taking them to our house, why don't we take them to the house of one of our parishioners? Uh, Vic had been to this house, and it was an impressive house. It was in the, the most wealthy part of the city of Houston, an area called River Oaks. It was one of these giant mansions that has the big horseshoe driveway and the big columns in front of the house. And, and, and he said, we'll just, we'll get them at the airport. They've never seen our house. We'll drive up to the, the front of the house. We'll park for just a minute. We'll watch them kind of have gaping mouths as they look at this new house. Then we'll let them in on the joke and we'll continue on to our much more modest house. Well, his daughters were all in on this. They thought this would be the greatest uh, uh, event of their life. And, and the only thing that Vic had left to do was he needed to get permission from his parishioners that owned this house in River Oaks if they could just borrow the driveway. So he shared the story with them. Well, when they heard the story, they were all in, but they said, we'd like to make it better. How about this? What if we leave the front doors unlocked and, and let the girls jump out of the car, run in, have one of your daughters who played the piano sit down at the grand piano, begin to play the, the grand piano. The other daughter can go in the kitchen. She can open the refrigerator. She can start making sandwiches for the girls, and then we'll come down and we'll explain to them that this is, is not really their house. Well, the girls heard this, and they thought that this was even better. And so the appointed day came, and they went to Houston Intercontinental Airport. They picked up the girls. They made their way to River Oaks. They pulled up in front of this magnificent-looking mansion in the horseshoe-shaped driveway. They get to the door. The girls bolt out of the car. The cousins follow right behind. They're in the house. Vic is a little slower getting the car parked, getting out of the car, walking around the car, and as he's walking up to the door, he gets a little nervous. 
something's not right. In fact, as he gets to the front door and opens the front door, he really knows that something is wrong now. They're at the wrong house. He really knows this when he walks in the door and there's a guy that's standing upstairs kind of hollering from the, the, the balcony over the, the balcony rail. What are you doing in my house? Vic very quickly responded with this question. Do, do you know who I am? The guy said, no, I don't know who you are. Vic said, that's really, really good. Let me get my daughters and get out of the house. Well, that question, do you know who I am, is a question that I want us to come back to in just a minute this morning. Do you know who I am? But first, I want to give you some homework. It's kind of what university presidents do, right? Here's, here's my homework for you. At lunch today, or, or maybe dinner tonight, or maybe sometime when you're having coffee, when you're sitting with a, 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 just another person, maybe your spouse or one of your kids, or maybe it's a group of people, ask and answer this question. If you got exiled to a deserted island and you could only take one book of the Bible with you, what's the one book that you would take and why do you choose that book? Well, I don't get to have lunch with you today and you may not ever invite me to coffee, so I'm going to tell you today what my choice would be. My choice would be the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. You say, Keith, why do you love the Gospel of John? Well, there's a lot of reasons why I love the Gospel of John. Partly because it's the story of Jesus. It's a different story of Jesus than you get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means seen together. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a lot alike. But John comes along, he writes the fourth Gospel, and it's completely different. It's 21 chapters. And if you read those 21 chapters, you'll discover that there is a consistent but different picture or portrait of Jesus in all 21 chapters. I love the Gospel of John. The thing that I've come to realize about the Gospel of John in recent days that, that I think I appreciate maybe even more is the fact that the Gospel of John is the series of conversations. Jesus talks to anybody and everybody that is willing to talk to him and some that maybe aren't willing to talk to him. He, he, he talks to very religious people. There's a couple of religious groups in those days, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he had conversations with them. He talked to irreligious or non-religious, semi-religious people. Jesus talked to fishermen and he talked to carpenters. He talked to, to soldiers and politicians and prostitutes. He talked to little boys and little girls. He talked to demon-possessed. He talked to blind people. He talked to deaf people. He talked to anybody that was willing to have a conversation with him. And, and, and I don't know this for a fact, but I wonder if when Jesus walked away from those conversations, he often thought to himself, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Not, don't you know who I am, but do you know who I am? Verse of scripture that I learned first as a child, and maybe it's true for many of you in this room, is found in the Gospel of John. It's maybe the most famous verse in the Bible. Say it with me out loud, John 3. Oh, you're really, really good. And let's see if we can say it together. We're going to put it on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Can I remind you today that when you begin your faith journey with Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus and you say, I believe, that's the beginning of eternal life. Eternal life does not begin when we breathe our last breath. It, it begins, according to John 3.16, when we say yes to Jesus, when we say yes to that invitation to believe. A couple of pictures are going to go up on the, uh, the screen here. Maybe you've seen these, these people before. The guy on the left there is the rainbow wig guy. Some of you in this service are, are old enough to remember this guy. Th this guy made it a habit to go around and get tickets. People began to give him tickets. He did this so often to sporting events. And in these sporting events, he would 
position himself in places where he could get on camera. Sometimes he had a sign that said John 3.16. Sometimes he wore a t-shirt that said John 3.16. He wore the rainbow wig, I think, to draw attention to, to himself. He, he became famous as the John 3.16 guy. The, the guy on the right that, that you see right there, that's Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow was a Heisman Award-winning quarterback for the University of Florida Gators, went on to play in the NFL for the, the Denver Broncos. He used to put scripture verses in the, the stenciled in the eye paint underneath his, his eyes to protect him from the glare. And one game, he decided that he was going to use the verse of scripture that we just quoted together a few minutes ago, John 3.16. You know what happened during that game? While that game was going on, people got on their, their phones or their iPads or their computers, not just a few people, 90 million people during that game Googled John 3.16. You know what bothers me the most about that? There were 90 million people out there that didn't know what many of us know, that John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 90 million people. We forget sometimes the context of, of John 3.16. John 3.16 was one of those conversations that I was telling you about. It was with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of those religious guys. He was a Pharisee. He was a, a teacher of the law. He, he came to see Jesus one night, and in the course of conversation, that's when Jesus spoke those words that we know as John 3.16. In those, those words, we find out that, that there is this invitation, and the invitation is a simple one. And sometimes I think we try and make what we do, what we're supposed to do, really, really complicated. But Jesus makes it really, really simple when he says we're to believe. Believe. In fact, believe is a, a word that is used in virtually every chapter, all 21 chapters in the Gospel of John, not just once in each chapter but over and over and over again, it was a big deal to Jesus. And it was an especially big deal to gospel writer John when he sat down to put pen to paper. So what does it mean to, to believe? What, what, is, what is biblical belief? Well, I was just kind of curious. There's a lot of conversations these days about artificial intelligence, right? AI. So I asked AI a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing this message, what does biblical belief mean? Here's what AI came up with. The word believe means to trust in Christ as the only way to obtain eternal life with God and to be saved by him. It also means to trust in God so strongly that you're willing to commit your life to him and to personally trust him as your Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but I think AI got it right. Now, at the heart of this idea of belief is intimacy. You say, how can that be true? Well, I think it's really, really true. Because if I believe in you, or you say that you believe in me, that's much more than a casual relationship. Uh, that's an intimate relationship. And I think that's what Jesus invites us to. Jesus invites us to a belief in him that creates this connection and this relationship that takes us through a journey with him. Now, one of the interesting things to me about believing is that uh, I can't make you believe. And you can't make me believe. A theologian wrote these words. He says, belief cannot be forced. If we're bullied or seduced or manipulated to believe, we do not end up believing. We end up intimidated or used, and we are less, not more. As Wesleyans, we believe in something called free will. 
Free will simply means that uh, it's your choice. Jesus doesn't twist your arm. Jesus doesn't beg you. Jesus doesn't beat you. He invites you to believe. Now, some people hear the story of John 3.16 shared with Nicodemus and boom, they believe. Sometimes that's because they grew up in a church. They, they grew up going to Sunday school. They grew up hearing those words, Jesus loves me, this, is, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sometimes those people that believe early, believe early because somebody brought them, like these three beautiful children were brought today, and they're dedicated to the Lord. Sometimes they believe because they've gone to camps, and they've been on mission trips, and and they've done all of the things that, that many of us were blessed to experience. But there are other people that that's not their experience. In fact, that's not even close to their experience. They, they, they never heard about Jesus. They never saw Jesus modeled, the lifestyle modeled for, for, for them. And so, so their journey to Jesus is much slower. And we have to be much more patient with them. Nicodemus, who I like to call Nick at night, got more laughs in this service than it did the last service. I don't think the last service knows who Nick at night, you know, actually is. But, but, but Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and I think Nick at night was one of those guys that was slower to come to faith. Again, he's a, a Pharisee. He's religious. He's a teacher of the law. He goes to the synagogue each week. But he comes to Jesus at night and he has this conversation about being born again. And Jesus says, for God so loved the world. Jesus says that unsolicited, that whoever believes in me shouldn't have to perish, but they have eternal life. But we don't see any conversion experience for Nick at night that night. If you go a little bit further into the seventh chapter, you'll read a little statement about Nicodemus again, and you see a little bit more maybe progression in the direction of Jesus. And then if you flip all the way over to the 19th chapter, again, the same book, the Gospel of John, you'll find that Nicodemus appears again in the story, and, and there he's with Joseph of Arimathea taking the body of Jesus and anointing the body of Jesus for burial. We don't know the complete story of Nicodemus, but what we do know about Nicodemus is that, that it appears that, that he was a work in progress. You may find yourself sitting here today or watching online, and you would describe yourself the same way. I, I'm still not sure. I'm in the investigation stage. I'm in the discovery stage. I'm, I'm watching those people around me. I'm reading scripture. I'm listening trying to determine whether or not I'm really going to accept this invitation to believe that Jesus offers. Well, I told you earlier, you, you can't be bullied into it. You can't be intimidated into it. Some of you read the message. The message was written by the late Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson was a pastor, and he was a professor, and he was a prolific author, and I think just such a a gift to the church. He certainly has been a gift in, in my life. Eugene Peterson tells this, this phenomenal story, I think, about when he was a little boy. A little boy growing up and dealing with a bully in his home state of Montana. And rather than, than try and tell you the story, let me read you the story. He said, I had been prepared for the wider world of neighborhood and school by memorizing Bless those who persecute you and turn the other cheek. He says, I don't know how Garrison Johns knew that about me. Some sixth sense that bullies have, I suppose. Most afternoons after school, he would catch me and he would beat me up. He also found out that I was a Christian. So he would taunt me with the words, Jesus, sissy. He said, I arrived home most days bruised and humiliated. My mother told me this had always been the way of Christians in the world and that I'd better get used to it. She also said I was supposed to pray for Garrison. One day I was with seven or eight friends when Garrison caught up with us in the afternoon and he started jabbing me. That's when it happened. Something snapped. For a moment, 
the Bible verses disappeared from my consciousness and I grabbed Garrison. To my surprise and his, I was stronger than he was. I wrestled him to the ground, sat on his chest, pinned his arms to the ground with my knees, and he was helpless at my mercy. It was too good to be true. I hit him in the face with my fists. It felt good. So I hit him again. Blood spurted from his nose, a lovely crimson in the snow. This is the author of the message that I'm reading to you about. I said to Garrison, say uncle. He wouldn't say it. So I hit him again. More blood. Then my Christian training reasserted itself. I said, say, I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood. I tried again. Say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he said it. Garrison Johns was my very first Christian convert. (laughs) Well, I think Pastor Rick has a much better attitude and idea. Let's live with our arms open wide, inviting people to believe in Jesus as opposed to punishing people with our fists. Well, I want to tell you this morning that Jesus doesn't just invite us to to believe. Jesus invites us to believe in the impossible, right? I mean, there's so much of what we read in Scripture that it's not possible, at least not in a a human sense. If you go on in the Gospel of John and you get to the ninth chapter, there's this, this interaction and this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, and the conversation is about a blind man. Not just any blind man, but it's a, it's a blind man that was blind from birth. And we don't know how old he was, but apparently he's been blind for a long time. And the disciples think that, that this man is blind for one of two reasons. He's blind either because he had sinned, or he's blind because his parents had sinned. Maybe his grandparents had sinned, but there's got to be some correlation between blindness, and sin. Well, Jesus straightens out their theology. Doesn't have anything to do with, with, with any of that. And, and then there's kind of a bonus. You know what the bonus is? The bonus is that the blind guy gets healed. The blind guy's an innocent bystander. He doesn't even know about the conversation, apparently. Doesn't really even know what's going on. And Jesus does a really guy thing. He spits. Spits in the, the dirt. Creates a little mud and some of you pay, pay big money to have mud put on your face, but, but, but imagine mud that Jesus spit on, put on the eyes of this guy, and the guy goes home for the very first time in his life he can see. Well, this creates quite a stir among the Pharisees. The Pharisees are upset because this is the impossible. How, how do we believe in the impossible? What do we do with impossible things? It doesn't make any sense. So they do an investigation. And they begin an interrogation. And and, I mean, they get in the blind guy's face. I shouldn't say the blind guy, the sighted guy's face because he can see now. And and they go to him and they're they're wanting to know what happened. Look at what he says. He says, whether he is a sinner, talking about Jesus, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Jesus invites us to believe the impossible. Jesus was concerned not just about the the guy's physical situation in life. He was concerned about his spiritual situation as well. I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message, and I got to thinking about how our physical condition so often drives us to prayer. And we're more concerned, I think, quite often for ourselves and for others about what the physical situation is as opposed to what the the spiritual situation is. But physical situations, physical circumstances get our attention. I was in the the pastor's study a number of years ago, and I received a phone call from a, a couple in my church that were faithful attenders there every time the doors were open. The husband was on the phone, his name is Lynn, and, and Lynn said, uh, Pastor, we, we got some bad news this week. 
that they had received a phone call from the doctor's office and invited Lynn and Lisa to the doctor's office to have a conversation about Lisa's pregnancy. It was her second pregnancy. It was an unexpected pregnancy. And they had done some testing, and the testing revealed some things that, that brought concern to the doctors. And so when they got to the office, not only was the doctor there, but there was a genetic counselor that was there as well. And they went over the test results, and they, they began to tell them about what might be true if the child was carried to full term and, and birth was given. In the state of Texas at that time, if Lisa was going to make a decision to terminate the pregnancy, the, the, the hours were counting down, and so she would have to make a decision quickly. Lynn and Lisa said, we left that office with no decision to be made because we saw this child is a gift from God, and we didn't know what was going to happen, but the idea of terminating the pregnancy never entered our mind. It was at that point that I found myself talking to them on the phone, and of course, as their pastor, I was concerned for them, and, and I said, would, would it be okay if, if next Sunday we just gathered a few people around the altar during the service, and, and without giving any kind of real description about what's going on, just anointed Lisa and prayed, and, and that's exactly what we did. A few months later, I stood in front of that same altar, and I held little Sawyer in my arms, and we dedicated him to the Lord, just like you saw here this morning. Fast forward a few more years, actually just a few years ago, and I stood on a stage in Sawyer, and Sawyer walked across the stage and received a diploma from me, shook my hand as a graduate of Southern Nazarene University. I think there's a picture that's going to go up right now because Sawyer's getting married right here in Oklahoma City next month. I, I tell you that story because... I don't know how God works in our lives. And, and we pray for things that don't happen. But, but what I do know is this this morning. Jesus invites us to believe in the impossible. I called Lynn a couple weeks ago and I said, Lynn, would it be okay if I, I shared that story? And he said, oh, we tell it all the time. We, I'd love it if you would, would share that story. He said, let me tell you a part of the story that you don't know. He said that the day that we came and knelt at that altar... He said, I felt like God had wrapped his arms around us and given us a giant hug. And he said, I got up from that altar not knowing what was going to happen, but knowing that whatever happened, he was going to walk with us and he was going to help us. Well, back to our, our guy who was healed of, of blindness. Jesus goes and finds him and... Uh, and he says, do you, do you believe in the Son of God? And, and the guy says, I, I, I don't know the Son of God, but if you'll help me meet the Son of God, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll believe. And Jesus says, I am he. And this is the response that Jesus gets. Yes, I believe, Lord. The invitation to you and to me to believe the impossible. Well, there's one last thing that I share with you before we're done this morning, and it's simply this. I believe that Jesus invites us to believe. I believe he invites us to believe the impossible, but I also he, it believe that he invites us to believe again. If you go over to the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, you'll read about a guy who was, uh, was a guy that just struggled along the way. He, he was a disciple, but he was kind of a glass half empty kind of guy. The Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, gives us two verses that tells us why John wrote the Gospel of John. Jesus did many other miraculous signs that his followers saw, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you can, you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Then by believing, you can have life through his name. Well, this guy Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, and, 
And you may remember his story, but back in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem, and Thomas was all in. He said, we'll go to, we'll die there with Jesus. One thing about people that see the glass kind of half empty, they're, they're loyal people, and, and he was loyal. He was going all the way through. But then back in the, the 20th chapter, Jesus has, has died. He's been resurrected. Thomas has not seen him yet. And Thomas says to his fellow disciples, his brothers in the faith, he says, I'll have to see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side. Only then will I believe it. Jesus isn't there for that conversation, but a week later, Jesus shows up without invitation, without explanation. Jesus gives him the opportunity to put his hands in his side, to touch the holes in his hands. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God, I believe. I love this verse, the 29th verse in John 20. You believe because you've seen me. Great blessings belong to the people who believe without seeing me. Jesus invites us to believe. He invites us to believe the impossible, the illogical, the things that don't make sense. But Jesus also invites us to believe again. Last story. A friend of mine bought an expensive sport coat, navy blue. He, he took it home and he wore it the first time and he loved it. It fit him just perfectly. He, he loved everything about the coat except for the fact that he discovered that it was a lint attractor. Everywhere he went, he was covered in, in lint. And he spent all of his time brushing his, his jacket off. And he, he took it home and he tried to wear it again, thinking it was just a one-time thing. And the same thing happened a second time and a third time. And finally, he just hung it in the closet, mad that he had ever purchased the, the sport coat. And every time he would open the closet, that jacket was there kind of mocking him, reminding him that he had made a very expensive purchase and it wasn't working out for him. One day after about three years, he was tired of being mocked, and so he, he grabbed the coat out of the closet, headed to his car, and he drove to the store. You see, the store that he had purchased this coat from was Nordstrom's, and he knew that Nordstrom's had this great customer service policy, this promise that, that they would refund anything almost no matter what. And so he decided that he was going to put it to the test. He marched into the store, but as he got in the store, he started feeling bad about the fact that the jacket fit and, and he really didn't have a good reason to return it other than it attracted Lent. But he was there, so he decided that he would finish his task. And he found a sales clerk in the men's department and Rather sheepishly, he walked up to him and he began to make his speech, hanging his head. I don't have the original sales receipt. It fits. I love the jacket. It attracts lint. I've heard that you guys will take it back. If you won't, it's okay, but I'm here to find out. And with that, he hung his head. It was quiet in the store. Finally, he looked up at the sales clerk who was smiling at him. And then he began to laugh. And he said to him, goodness gracious, what took you so long? We're so glad that you brought it back. Bring it here to me. We're going to take care of this and get you what you want. I wonder, and I can't prove it, but I think scripture bears this out that maybe Jesus says the same thing to us. I want to help you. I'm just inviting you to believe, to believe the impossible, maybe to believe again. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to sing and we're going to do something that's a little bit different, but I've got some friends that 
are coming and they're, they're going to be around the altar and some of them are even in the back so that you don't even have to come all the way to the altar, but they've got anointing oil. And I'm just wondering this morning if there might be some people here that would want to testify, I believe, by being anointed because you've got an impossibility in your life. Maybe there's a healing that needs to be taken place. It could be a physical healing. It could be a spiritual healing. Maybe you are like the dad in Mark chapter 9 who said to Jesus, I I do believe. Help me to believe more. As we sing and we testify to our faith in Jesus, if you want to be anointed this morning, I'd invite you to come and receive that anointing. Jesus 
receive this benediction today. Lord Jesus, we believe that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made, created in Christ Jesus, your workmanship, to go out and do the good works that you've already prepared in advance for us to do. May we go believing that you 